Thank you, choir and epic youth, instrumentalist, and media team. This morning, if you have not already, if you'll be finding in your copy of God's Word, John's Gospel, chapter 8, John's Gospel, chapter 8, and verse number 21. John's Gospel, chapter 8, verse number 21. When you get there, if you're able, will you stand with me as we honor God and the reading of His Word? John's Gospel, chapter 8, verse 21. Hear the word of the Lord. Then he said to them again, I am going away. You will look for me and you will die in your sin. Where I'm going, you cannot come. And so the Jews said again, he won't kill himself, will he? Since he says, where I'm going, you cannot come. You are from below, he told them. I am from above. You are of this world. I am not of this world. Therefore, I told you that you will die in your sins. For if you do not believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. Who are you, they questioned. Exactly what I've been telling you from the very beginning, Jesus told them. I have many things to say and to judge about you, but the one who sent me is true. And what I have heard from him, these things I tell the world. They did not know he was speaking to them about the Father. So Jesus said to them, When you lift up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he, and that I do nothing on my own. But just as the Father taught me, I say these things. The one who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone because I always do what pleases Him. May God in His blessing to the reading, and now the preaching, and your hearing to understand His holy word. And may our Lord Jesus Christ forever be praised, and all of God's people say, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Most of you know what it's like to travel long distances on our nation's interstate highway system. Some of you even know what it's like to travel long distances on the interstate with me. I don't do those trips like I did anymore in the past, but many of you have traveled lots of long distances with me. Some of the young adults who used to be in the youth group and and, uh, going in in the bus and hoping it wouldn't overheat going up the mountain and all those type of things. But you know what it's like to to go on the interstate going somewhere. You're driving there. You figure out from your home the quickest way you can get to the interstate from your house, and then you drive as long as you can on the interstate, never driving more than four miles over the posted speed limit because you don't want a ticket. And depending on the length of the journey that you're going to be on the interstate, you make a few pit stops along the way to get gas and and for relief. Uh, One thing I, I noticed, and I knew this already, this past summer when we went to Disney, to Disney World, My whole family, nine of us, went and we had rented a van. You make a lot better time on the interstate if you leave at 2 o'clock in the morning and everybody else goes to sleep. And the reason you make better time is because with with nine people with you, you're you're going to be... you, You cannot get everybody to use the bathroom at the same time for some reason. So you try to make as few pit stops as possible. You have to make a few along the way. But then as you're traveling on that journey, on the interstate, you finally see that big green sign that tells you this many miles to exit whatever something be. That's your exit that you're going to take to get off of the interstate. And when you finally take the exit, you know that usually the major portion of your journey is complete. Maybe a few turns here or there, a country highway a few miles on it, or or maybe some city streets that you have to navigate. And then you've arrived at your long-awaited destination. Now, if you're, as I described earlier, if you're traveling on family vacation, when you turn off the interstate and begin making the final turns, you're, you're filled with excitement and anticipation and, and joy, and, and whoever was driving is filled with relief. And, and, but that's not always the case. Sometimes when you take the exit, maybe the, the journey is that you're traveling to a beloved one's funeral. 
in a other state, and you take the exit and you have a sense of somberness and reality. We're here. This, this is real. Well, you understand all of that. Well, at this point in the Gospel of John, Jesus has taken the exit off of the interstate of his earthly ministry. He is going to the cross. He fully understands the pain that he will endure, as well as the fulfillment of the Father's plan and the completion of our plan of salvation that he will purchase. Exit cross this side. He's just pulled off the interstate. Six months, six months later from Jesus right here in these verses, six months from here, Jesus saying these words to the Pharisees at the Feast of Tabernacles, six months later, he's going to be saying, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do on the cross. He knows it's coming. Time is running short. The tempo picks up. The intensity the intense, well, the intensity intensifies. And he begins talking again to these Pharisees like we were seeing last week in the same conversation. And he begins by telling those who's questioning him that we have, number one, different destinations. Verse 21, he says to them, I'm going away. You're going to look for me and not find me. You're going to die in your sins. And where I am going, you cannot come. Different destinations. The Pharisees, the religious leaders who were questioning Jesus, had a different destination than Jesus did. Where I'm going, you cannot come. Where are you going? Well, when you leave the worship service this morning, where are you going? Are you going to a restaurant to eat lunch or going back home and and have a hastily made sandwich and get in the recliner, or you're going to grandmother's house, or, or maybe you've got uh, three items that you've got to pick up at Walmart to complete the school project that your child didn't tell you about until yesterday. Or Where are you going when you leave here this morning? Some of you, many of you maybe, most, were thinking about where you're going when you leave here this morning when you walk in the door. You were thinking of your next place to go. But Jesus is talking about destinations with more finality. He is foreshadowing what's going to happen next in his life and in the lives of the religious leaders to whom he's speaking. He's not talking about where you're where are you going to go after the Feast of Tabernacles is over? Where are you going when you leave the temple? No, he's talking about final, eternal destinations. Remember this, Jesus is talking to unbelievers. Jesus is talking to people who do not believe in him. He's talking to people who should have believed, but refused to believe in Jesus as the Christ, the Messiah. And he tells them, I'm going one place and you are going somewhere else. Pretty plain, isn't it? Anybody with me this morning? I'm going one place, you're going somewhere else. He doesn't give them all the details. I don't think he has to. From our perspective, looking back to that point, it, it makes per perfect sense, pretty easy to figure out. And these religious leaders... They should have figured it out too. Jesus says to them, I'm from above where the Father is in heaven and I am going back there. I am going back to heaven where the Father is. He makes it just as plain as he could. And he's telling them, you're not going to the same place I'm going. You can't come because of your unbelief. And he tells them again and again, you're going to die in your sins. Do you know what the practical application of that is? They're going to hell. They're going to die in their sins because they refuse to believe. And folks, I believe that when Jesus is saying this, He's speaking directly to a specific group of people that He knew everything about. 
And by the way, he knows everything about every person in this room this morning. And he knew that this group of people there in front of him, that they not only did not believe in him at that moment, but that they would not believe even after his death, burial, and resurrection. He was looking at the same group of people who were probably the same folks in the book of Acts who were trying to destroy the infant church, and they could not. But they should have been the ones to believe. That's what just doesn't make sense. That's what is so hard to fathom. These were the religious leaders. These were the teachers of the Scripture. They were well versed in all the Old Testament prophecies. They had all the evidence, and yet they refused to believe. And what about you? Both those of you who are here in this sanctuary this morning and those who are watching us live or who will watch us later today, why haven't you committed your life to Jesus Christ? Why haven't you? Are you refusing to believe? I think, I hope, I pray, I've done at least an adequate job of explaining the gospel I hope, I pray, I've I've made it simple enough for the boys and girls to understand. If you don't understand the sermon, hopefully you at least heard the gospel in the children's moment. I hope, I pray, the gospel has been plain to you. Why haven't you believed? You know how you felt when the invitation hymn was given before. You felt God tugging at your heart at the invitation. Don't be like those folks who who should have believed but refused. Don't be like those who heard, had every opportunity, and did not believe, and they died in their sins. And if you refuse to believe, you will die in your sins too. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ today. Different destinations. The reason that Jesus could say this was was because he was not only man, very man, he was also God, very God. Listen to me. Jesus was not only man, very man. Jesus was God, very God. Number two, he could, number two, declare his deity. In verse 25, They say, who are you? They question. Jesus says, exactly what I've been telling you from the beginning. Then on two different occasions, he says, I am he. I can just imagine Jesus' frustration. Let me get a witness if you ever get frustrated. Jesus got frustrated too. He was man, very man. And how frustrated did he get when they asked him, now, now, who are you? Jesus says, I mean, guys, how many times do I have to tell you? I've told you this from the beginning, who I am. Parents, can you empathize with Jesus? Where are my socks? They're in the top drawer where they've been for the last six years. Teachers, educators, I'm only going to say this one time. Ha! See how that works. Me! Well, I didn't even know that was going... No, nobody told me what was... It's been on the screen for three weeks, in the bulletin for three weeks. It was on Facebook. We sent out the text message reminder. I did everything but send you a certified letter. Jesus says, I've been telling you this from the beginning, and you're asking me again, who I, now who are you? He says, I am He. In verse 28 and other places, that phrase, when he says, when Jesus says, I am he, any Jew with a half a day in Jewish Sunday school should have recognized that was a divine, 
declaration. I am is the name of God going all the way back to to Abraham and Isaac and and Jacob and Moses. When Jesus said that, it was supposed to be unmistakable. Verse 25, Jesus says, again they say that, He says, I've been telling you this, this very thing, I've been telling you this from the beginning. I've been telling you this the whole time. But folks, he had not only been telling them, he had been showing them. They should have seen it, but they still didn't get it. Verse 27, they did not know he was speaking to them about the Father. They still didn't get it. He told them, he showed them, he demonstrated it, he proved it, and they still, they didn't understand. Their hearts were hardened. The Bible tells us, harden not your hearts as you did in the rebellion. Their necks were stiff. Their hearts hearts were hardened. They heard what Jesus said in verse 23. I mean, these are red letters. Jesus says, you are from below. I am from above. You are of this world. I am not of this world. But they, with their hard hearts and stiff necks and stopped up ears and closed eyes, refuse to believe. No, no wonder. They thought Jesus was talking about suicide. Well, you know, is he going to... Well, he's describing his death, number three, but that's very different. Verse 28, when we get there, verse 28, so Jesus said to them, when you lift up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am He, and that I do nothing on my own, but just as the Father taught me, I say these things... The one who sent me is with me. He's not left me because I always do what pleases him. When Jesus says in verse 28, when you lift up the Son of Man, folks, that's the crucifixion, that's the cross. He's talking about being lifted up on the cross, not on a pedestal, on the cross. He's talking about his hands being nailed to the cross. He's talking about the crown of thorns. He's talking about the scourging and beating. He's talking, he's talking about the shame and mockery of the, it's the crucifixion. Earlier, they, they wondered if Jesus was talking about suicide in, a, in verse 20 something earlier. Well, is he going to kill himself because he says, I'm going where you cannot go? No, he's not talking about suicide, but an execution. An execution of an innocent man. He knows, do you see this? Jesus knows he's going to the cross. He knows the pain of the cross that awaits him. And I wonder if the tone of Jesus' voice changed. I wonder if his face grimaced as he gave the description of his death. His cross awaited him. The cross, his death for our sins, that's why he was there. He took the exit off the interstate of his ministry to the cross because the cross was his destination. That was his purpose. All the other things were extra. He turned the water into wine, but his purpose wasn't to have a big party. He healed the sick, but his mission wasn't to temporarily delay some funerals. He fed the multitude with five loaves and two fish, but his mission was not a welfare system. No, he came to die, to die a cruel death as an innocent man, and yet he knew that was the Father's plan of salvation. And yet he knew that was the only way that our sins, your sins, and my sins, and the children's sins, and the teenagers' sins, and the adults' sins, and the old folks' sins could be forgiven. The universal law of God, the universal cosmic law of God is that the cost or the wages or the penalty of sin is death. That's why in the Old Testament, the Old Testament is a bloody mess. This sacrifice of this sheep or this 
goat or this duck. It's full of all these sacrifices. Why? You go to any culture, any ancient culture, and you will find in every ancient culture there was animal sacrifice. Why? Because the universal law of God is that the cost of sin, the wages or the penalty of sin is death. That's why Jesus, the perfect Lamb of God, died once for all to fulfill the cost. Jesus says the Father was with him. Jesus was faithful, even knowing what was to come. Jesus says, the Father is always with me because I always do what pleases Him. That was foreshadowing of, of a moment that was coming. Do you remember the seven sayings of Jesus on the cross? He's, he's on the cross, hung before heaven above and hell below. And He cries out, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. And He cries out, I thirst but this one phrase he cries out, one of the seven, he says, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? It was fulfillment of prophecy in Psalm 22 when he cried that out. At that moment, the Father wasn't with him. Our sins were laid upon him. Your, all of your lies... And all of your lusts and all of your indiscretions and all of your cheatings and all of your blasphemies and all of your cussing and everything, all of our sins were at that moment laid upon Him. And God the Father in His perfect holiness for the first time in all of eternity had to turn His face away from His Son. He could not look upon His Son covered in our sins. Your sins and my sins were laid upon Him. He, you know where the term scapegoat comes from? In the Old Testament, the priest would take a goat and would lay his hands on that goat and symbolically transfer the people's sins onto that goat before it would be driven out to die. Jesus is the scapegoat. Your sins and my sins were laid upon him so that we can be forgiven so that we can have salvation and eternal life. What love! What wondrous love is this, that Christ would die for me, that He would take my sins upon Himself, that He would endure the cross for me. My sins. So what about you? You. The next verse, which will be our opening verse in next week's sermon, says, As he was saying these things, many believed on him. Will you be one of them? Will you be one of those to believe? How many times does, does Jesus have to convince you? you? You don't know how many more opportunities you will have. Will you die in your sins and go to hell? Or will you repent and believe and go with Jesus to heaven above? Are you a real believer? Then ask yourself this, does my commitment to Christ and His church really look like I'm a real believer? Why? What will be your final destination? Heavenly Father, I pray this morning for everyone in the sound of my voice, both those present and watching, that by your Holy Spirit you would draw those who are doubting and in unbelief to salvation full and free, salvation by grace through faith, salvation purchased by your Son Jesus that you would draw them today in this invitation to come forward publicly in commitment to you. 
Father, if there are other decisions that need to be made, we pray for liberty for all these decisions, whether joining this church by baptism or letter or statement. Someone needs to come and pray at the altar. Lord, let them feel liberty to do that. Bless this invitation for your glory. We pray in Jesus' name and all of God's people say, Would you stand as we have our hymn of invitation?